related. Here's our reader, John Letcher. Thank you, Virgil. The Walker children, John, Susan, Titty, and Roger, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have minutes from two meetings on our agenda for approval tonight, the regular meeting um, on January 11th and a special meeting where we went into executive session for the, to start the manager's evaluation held on January 28th. Could I have a motion on those, please? Move we'll acceptance, uh, Madam Chair. Thank Sorry. you. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. All those in favor? Was opposed? 6-0, thank you. We have a time on our agenda for citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there a citizen who would like to come to the podium this evening to discuss something? I'm going to request that we do have somebody <laughs> come to the podium. Paula Liberty, who is chairman of the Middle School Building Committee, wishes to update the council on the operation of that committee. We thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you. Madam Chairman, Council Members, Mr. McGovern, and fellow residents, I am pleased to be here this evening on behalf of the Middle School Building Committee to report on our progress. The committee first met on November 19, 1992. After briefly getting acquainted and armed with our copies of the excellent work produced by the Cape Elizabeth School Study Committee, we delved into the business at hand. The committee charge was reviewed and discussed, concluding that, first, the administrative structure previously approved by the school board would be the basis of the program, that is, K through 4 elementary, 5 through 8 middle school, and 9 through 12 the high school, with the kindergarten physically located at the high school, as it presently is. Secondly, the committee needed to consider the entire school complex, in particular the Middle and Pond Cove schools, as they are located on one campus and have similar problems. Superintendent Goldman reviewed the various reports and offered a glimpse of the condition of our facilities and deficiencies in physical plant and space hindering our ability to foster our educational programs. We were all anxious to see firsthand the conditions and scheduled the tour on December 5th. In order to accomplish the goals of the committee, we concluded that an architect needed to be retained and the selection process should be undertaken immediately. We formally advertised for qualified architectural firms requesting receipt of proposals by December 15th. On December 5th, Connie directed a tour of the facilities. Although many of us had been in the building for school functions over the years, we never paid serious attention to the physical plan. It became very apparent that the previous studies and decisions by the school board to investigate solutions for upgrading our schools is warranted. On December 17th, we reviewed the 14 proposals received from architects. The committee was impressed with their professionalism and qualifications. After establishing selection criteria and re reviewing all of the proposals, we shortlisted the following firms. Harriman Associates, Portland Design Team, Ray Associates, Stevens, Morton, Rose, and Thompson, known as SMRT. We formally notified all firms of our decision and scheduled interviews with those selected. The architects made formal presentations to the full committee on January 14th. We had an opportunity to question each firm regarding their ability and qualification. The criteria established for selection included similar project experience, ability and capability of the firm, use of consultants, the grasp of the project, creativity, chemistry with the committee, and references which were previously checked by members of our committee. Given the qualifications and excellent presentations, we quickly discovered that our task would not be easy. After a lengthy discussion and consideration, 
I polled each member and determined that the firm of SMRT was the preferred architect. In the interest of assuring ourselves that SMRT would be the best selection, we decided to request a second interview with the principal personnel assigned to our project. SMRT made their presentation on January 18th. This interview afforded the opportunity to have a more interactive dialogue without the constraint of time. The team demonstrated an excellent working relationship and a clear understanding of our goals and objectives. They have the depth of organization, an excellent track record in successfully completing pro com complex projects, a thorough grasp of the project, and a staff that can listen and implement the owner's program. They appear to be extremely responsive to budget constraints and demonstrated a genuine interest in working with us. It was a unanimous vote to select SMRT. At our meet next meeting on February 3rd, we reviewed their proposal for services. As a result of our discussion and recommendations, I am pleased to inform you that the school department has entered into a contract with SMRT for planning and schematic design services for renovations, modifications, and or additions to the Cape Elizabeth Middle School and Pond Cove Elementary School. This contract will carry us through referendum. The process will involve various scheduled meetings over the next three or four months to discern the needs, establish options, and prepare recommendations. We anticipate the architect to complete his study by June 1st. The committee is keenly aware of the need for community involvement to ultimately propose an appropriate project that meets our educational program. Our committee is looking forward to the work ahead and providing the information necessary for you to decide on the best and most economical, economically feasible solution to our current problems in our program. We have scheduled our first meeting with the architects this Thursday at 7 p.m. Respectfully submitted, Paul Liberty. Thank you, Paul. Any council questions? Councilor Dahlbeck. Not a question, just a comment that, uh, uh, as you know, Councilor Jordan and I are serving on that committee, and uh, I think it's safe to say that uh, we feel very strongly about how uh, uh, well we are led by Paul, who has been doing a great job, uh, and the selection uh, that we have done of the architect. Uh, uh, it was a real thorough process. Some of the folks like myself don't know that much, but we have a lot of expertise on the committee in addition to uh, us, and uh, I'm just very pleased with uh, the progress that has been made. Thank you. Any other counselors? Appreciate your updating us, and we look forward to having you back and keeping us informed. Thank you. Thanks a lot for coming tonight. <coughs> Are there any other citizens who wish to come to the podium and comment at this time? We don't have a very big audience so far this evening. Next on the agenda is council reports and correspondence. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Are you ready? Councillor Chapel. The uh, Regional Waste Services Board met three times since our last meeting on the council. On the 21st of January, we had a report of the progress of the Gorham facility and also a report of the progress of the construction work being done in the cleaning of one of the large boilers on the Baybury Road project. The Finance Committee met on the 27th, and our main thing at the 27th was tonnage. We are going to have a little problem in the communities if we have many more, as you probably saw in the paper this morning, thinking of going for the, uh, picking up the bag at the curbside at a small cost per bag. Uh, we're finding that as these towns, the only one so far is Freeport, and uh, it's working very well, but it is showing us about a 35% decline in tonnage at RWS from that town, or whether that's going to surrounding towns or towns uh, people taking the rubbish with them in Portland in the morning and putting it in their dumpsters rather than paying the price per bag, we don't know. But it's down 35% in the first two months that they ran. Then on February the 3rd, Michael was good enough to drive the two of us up to a meeting with the DEP in uh, Freeport. We didn't win anything. We didn't lose anything. But we came out good. 
We're still open at the Cape, and we hope to stay open until the, I think the DEP got the uh, message pretty clearly that the towns didn't want to go into something that was more expensive right at this particular time to take waste and so forth out of town to somewhere else. That didn't seem to be the right answer when the place that you're taking it might not be as well run as where you are. Ours is one of the outstanding landfills in the state, and uh, very little can be said about it the way it's being run. In fact, it's pretty near closed. But we want to keep the transfer station, we want to keep shipping, we want to keep taking leaves there, and things like that until, only until, Gorham is ready to open. So we got that message across, and whether it's going to do any real good, why, Michael can jump in when I'm done and, and tell you, but that's what I saw, and that's the way I feel. While I'm here with the microphone, I'd like to give you the schedule of municipal budget workshops that are coming up. I would uh, know that you all want to take uh, the time out to turn your TV sets on and watch these uh, budget workshops. They're so fascinating. The uh, March the 27th, 8 a.m., we have all day. That's really a nice one. Would you tell the them what day of the week that is so they don't think we're... March the 27th? What day it is? Which Saturday, day? so we can get everybody. 8 a.m. all day, Department of Budget Review. It, it's, it's fun. You, you want to come and, and watch it. It's really fun. March the 29th, if the 27th is Saturday, 29th must be a Monday. 7.30 p.m., we meet with the school board. We're looking forward to that one. April 1st, 7.30 p.m., community services, and further with the school if we need any questions or they need any clarification, why we'll be available to get together again with them. April the 6th at 7.30 p.m., review of capital budget from our town manager and pending issues. April the 12th at 7.30 p.m., regular town council meeting when we will set a public hearing on the budget itself. May the 10th, 7.30 p.m., we'll have a public hearing on the budget and then the regular town council meeting. And May the 31st is the town charter requires budget adoption by this date. That's our list of dates and we'll follow them down through and I think everything this year is going to come out very well from the progress that some of the departments are making towards their budget process, just waiting for a few words of wisdom from the council and the manager and the so forth, and I think it's going to come out good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Chappell. Any other correspondence or reports this evening? It's a hard act to follow. <laughs> Mr. McGovern? Yeah, I just wanted to publicly thank the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department. Uh, this morning we had uh, a water uh, pipe that was on the side of the building here. Uh, that, that broke sometime around 6, probably about 6 a.m. We're not too sure of the exact time, I believe it was then. And uh, they, the alarm went out and uh, I'd say 15 to 20 uh, volunteer uh, firefighters showed up and uh, proceeded to uh, vacuum the floor and squeegee the water. And uh, while it's still very wet and miserable, uh, at least all the puddles are gone. And uh, it was really helpful to see the fire department in action. And, uh, wish to express appreciation for their work. It wasn't deep enough to meet the wet team, I hope. It was wet. <laughs> <laughs> I've asked the town clerk to be ready to discuss the municipal elections at this time. Would you like to do that, please? Mr. Thank Mr. you very much. So all the citizens in Cape Elizabeth know nomination papers for both school board and council will be available in my office beginning Thursday, February 18th. The nomination papers are due back in my office by 4.30 on Tuesday, March 30th. Uh, the mu municipal election is held the first Tuesday in May, which will be May 4th, at the Cape Elizabeth High School Gymnasium. Uh, if you're not familiar with the process, nomination papers must be signed by at, at least 25 and not more than 100 registered voters in Cape Elizabeth. If anyone has specific questions about the process, I'd be glad to answer any questions. And this information also has been given to the school board, and if they have any questions, they can also get a hold of me as well. There are How many seats? I'm sorry. There are two seats available on the council, two seats on the school board, and all of the seats are three-year okay. elected positions. Thank you very much. Any other reports and correspondence? <coughs> I have just a few. There is a committee that you've been hearing a little bit about. The I call it the Mayors and Chairs Committee. It's um, Council 
chairman, mayors, and first selectmen of the greater Portland area, basically, which is getting more extensive. We had the mayor from Saco there um, last week. The February meeting was held in Westbrook, and we heard from we heard more about the issues about surrounding the downsizing of Pine Land and Am High. We had the commissioner of mental health. We had a representative from. Um, Pineland Center. We had the superintendent of Am High Augusta Mental Health Institute, and a gentleman who was the community head of the community programs for the Bureau of Mental Retardation. Just very interesting information um, because that does downsizing and closing certainly impact all the communities in the area. The March meeting is what I want to make my fellow counselors aware of. It's Thursday, March 4th. It's always the first Thursday. It will be held in Wyndham. The topics for discussion are manager evaluations, and I think this council has, I believe what this council has come up with, and I'll cite Dick Dahlbeck specifically for some of the good work in coming up with our, our manager evaluation format is going to be presented that evening as <laughs> so an example for other councils to follow. Um, there'll be the second part of the evening is scheduled to be a report and discussion about expenditure control budgeting, which Wyndham has, is trying again this year. They seem <coughs> quite pleased with that way of setting their budget. So if anybody wants to go to that, just let me know and we'll find a way to get you there. Um, did hear news of rumor last week um, out of Augusta about the June payment of revenue sharing being eliminated. I've talked with both Jane Amro and Steve Simons last night, and the best, to the best of their knowledge, that is not going to happen, but they are certainly both on top of that. And very responsive, had very good conversations with both of them. They were both also present at the Chamber of Commerce Eggs and Issues breakfast last one morning last week where the speakers were John Martin and Dennis Dutremble. And I imagine you've all read in the newspaper that um, Speaker of the House John Martin was, at least it sounded like he was opening the door for the possibility of a local option tax, which that door had been firmly closed in the past. Um, basically found both gentlemen to offer quite conciliatory, conciliatory comments that morning. And I think it was very interesting presentation. Wednesday this week, I believe it's four counselors and the manager will be going to a meeting in Augusta that is sponsored by both MMA, Maine Municipal Association, and the Maine Chamber of Commerce um, for business interests and governmental interests to be meeting with the legislators. Over 400 people are expected at that meeting, so it should be the most interesting presentation. Mr. McGovern, you're giving you're president of MMA, so you're giving a speech that morning that I know you're working on. <laughs> We're looking forward to hearing that, certainly, too. Another piece of correspondence I want to make counselors aware of is that Ken Cole, who is now chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Civic Center, is issuing an open invitation to us to attend any of their meetings. They are held at noon on the third Tuesday of the month at the Civic Center. So anybody who's interested in that is more than welcome to go. And that is all that I have. So onward with the agenda. I lost my agenda. Thank you. We have item number 96, which is to consider a recommendation from the Cape Elizabeth School Board to name the softball field on the school grounds the Edmund M. Capano Field and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern, do you have information on that? Or? I, the superintendent of schools is here. Did, did you want to say some, Connie, or did you? Uh, would you like me to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, obviously, all, a lot of us knew Ed and respect his memory and remember him as a caring, hardworking, and uh, really um, witty person, a joy to be with, and I'm sure um, positive influence on many young people. I understand that the field originally had been named in his honor and then uh, but never officially designated and it seems very fitting for us to do this to this point so obviously the town council at their uh, January meeting took a vote to pass it along to you uh, with the understanding that that would be something that you would be supportive of. Thank you very much. Any questions? Would like a motion please? So moved. Second. 
I would just like to say, Mr. Capano certainly had influence on some of the older members of the community. I'm very proud to say I w was one of Ed's girls. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have a motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? 7-0. Thank you. Item number 97 is to consider authorizing a $130,000 note for the Cape Elizabeth School Department pursuant to discussions during the budget process this past year and take any necessary action. And I think we can continue with the discussion on that, that Connie. Um, yes, uh, during, as, as you say, during the budget session uh, last year, we did ask uh, for permission to do some short-term borrowing to reduce the total um, amount of the budget for tax purposes this year. Uh, I believe you've received a memo that outlines the specifics, um, in case you don't happen to have it in front of you, I'll quickly go down. Uh, the, essentially what we had um, talked about pulling out would be some expenses tied to the renovation of the high school math, former high school math wing, now the kindergarten cen center actually some of those expenses we were able to fold into our regular budget, but there were some pieces that we thought were appropriate. That's about at 30,460. District ride computers at 41,648. Uh, school bus purchase at 31,892. And uh, the last item, lockers at Pond Cove Lunch School, 26,000 for a total of 130,000. Uh, one of the things that I do want to point out to you that we had lockers in our budget last year. We were able to absorb some of that expense um, through the regular school budget, and we had originally, uh, as actually before Christmas, as we were reviewing the exact amount to um, ask uh, uh, the town manager to go forward with the borrowing, uh, we were closer to the 100,000 mark. Frankly, uh, what has happened since then is that we have a fire chief report uh, that requires us now to immediately go forward with completing that locker process. We had started it last year at the fourth grade <coughs> end of the building and intended to put some money in this year's budget for next year to continue that process. Uh, it appears now that that is a, something we must do ASAP. Therefore, um, I am putting that dollar figure in there. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for the superintendent? I'd like a motion. You got it. I move. Uh -huh. Any? Mr. Uh, McGovern. I just have a, <laughs> one comment. What is being moved is the the draft motion that was prepared by Bond Council. Just for the record. Thank you. I, I would assume. I assume so, and hope that we don't have to read that entire thing into the official record here. But we do have it, and it's available at the town clerk's office. Is there any discussion from council? Okay. All those in favor of the note, the bond, four hundred and thirty thousand dollars. It's a note. I've got to be careful. It's a note. All those in favor. I'm sorry. I was still. All those opposed. Okay. Six to one. Council. Oh, I had my hand up once, and oh. I was waiting to get the rest of them. And I got tired and put it. Down. I think it's a seven zero. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. Yeah, put it up again. <laughs> you give the man a cake, and look what happens. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Connie. <laughs> <laughs> Item number 98 is to consider acknowledging receipt of the capital improvement program for fiscal years 1994 to 1998 and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? Yes, I'm pleased to present to you the capital improvement program. Uh, it's slightly different style and format than we had in previous years. Uh, tried to have a lot fewer numbers just spread on a page and a little bit more explanation. If you, if you notice the cover, um, it, it shows uh, the, one of the annual monthly budget reports, and I think that's important uh, because it shows that, you know, ultimately the capital improvement program uh, does reflect in the budget, and uh, I think it's important for all of us to remember that. <coughs> No comments. We knew this would make you <laughs> shudder. <laughs> uh, within the, the different sections, I think if you go to page four, uh, really provides a, a fairly succinct summary. Uh, this past year, those items that would be considered capital improvements consumed 4% of the total amount of taxation. Uh, over the next five years, it, it's proposed that it range from 4.59% to 6.17%. I think 
you know, obviously there aren't going to be a lot more resources available from taxpayers, nor from the state, nor other resources. The real challenge is going to be to have shifting within the budget to make sure that we, we can begin to accomplish some of these priorities as well as the ongoing operations of the community. Uh, in, in the different areas, public safety, uh, the highlights are uh, improved communications, uh, the uh, continuation of a fire vehicle replacement program, and uh, a projection that in, in a couple of years uh, we would perhaps uh, improve the public safety facilities here in the center of town. Uh, there is no specific proposal on that yet, but it's felt that uh, that is about the time it would be looked at and is following through on a recommendation on the, of the Municipal Facilities Committee. In the area of public works, uh, to continue an adequate roadway improvement program, a normal replacement of trucks and equipment at the transfer station. Uh, the Fort Williams Master Plan calls for 500000 in spending. This proposal only recommends 200000 and suggests that we need to look at alternative revenue sources to continue support of the park. Uh, this is something that uh, the Service Delivery Option Committee is uh, looking at as well. Uh, in the area of general government, uh, computer upgrades, unfortunately, almost now, as, as soon as you buy software and hardware, computers, uh, it, it seems to be out of date. Uh, a, a very interesting program we hope to begin this com during this year, but later in the year, is an excise tax online program uh, whereby we could finally send out reminders when excise taxes are due. Uh, we could also reduce the time folks are in the office and reduce the time for reporting to the state of a much better system. Uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, the, this, this building had a little water problem today. Uh, I think that was a little reminder that this, this building is getting old. And at the, about five years from now, uh, it's felt that we, we ought to be taking a, a good hard look at this building and perhaps uh, making some investment in it in terms of not only handicapped improvements, but particularly in some of the mechanical and heating systems. Uh, it, is, it is very much uh, starting to age. Uh, in the library, some uh, minor uh, changes, with the one exception of replacing the handicap lifts uh, three years out, which have never really worked right uh, uh, all along. We, we uh, contemplated litigation at the beginning and uh, uh, were recommended by attorney that we didn't have that strong a position since they did work and met all codes. But anyway, we uh, think those ought to be replaced. Uh, that is uh, the proposed program. Uh, later on, during the budget process, as uh, Finance Chairman Chapel mentioned, you will be uh, separately reviewing this, and particularly uh, with the recommendations for fiscal year 1994. So, be happy to answer any questions anyone may have. Thank you. Are there any questions of the manager? Councilor Cogswell? Yes, um, Mr. McGovern, there on one of these pages, you talk about the station replacement. Yes. Because of the Municipal Facilities Committee uh, recommendations, and that this should be considered in the context of the ongoing work plan for the middle and elementary school. Yes. Is it? Uh, I meant that in, in two terms. One is from a design viewpoint and a site viewpoint, how that goes. And secondly, uh, in terms of financing, uh, what's going to be the impact of the school projects on the taxpayers at any given point? and what would be this impact and do you look at the impact and get it all out of the way at once or do you uh, uh, you know put this off you know no matter what you know we're looking at some expensive projects and I, I just think they all need to be looked at together and that, that's the suggestion that's there both from a finance as well as from a site from site considerations but do you know if the middle school building committee is aware that we're considering this no, I think that they're fairly early in the process at this point. Okay. We do have two members mm -hmm. of that committee to your right. Rely on them. Councilor Dahlbeck. I, I don't know uh, whether this is a uh, question for the town manager or for uh, Councilor Chapel, but uh, I just want to make sure that we have a chance to discuss the long-term programs on here and not just when it comes to budget. You always have a tendency to want to crunch in and, and uh, take care of that more immediate problem and uh, I think we ought to spend some time discussing the long-term uh, situation here. I've just put it down as a workshop topic for us. Just if I may, I think when you receive the report of the Service Delivery Options Committee, 
some of the longer term issues indirectly and directly relate to uh, some of the recommendations yeah. Very good. Any other comments or questions? Councilor Jordan? Yes, I'd like to ask the manager, would we receive that report in time to when we're putting the budget together? I hadn't I wanted to discuss that with the chairman and I haven't yet. Uh, they expected the report ready at the end of February. However, the chairman has a conflict that can't be so that he can't be at the March meeting. And I hadn't really discussed with the chairman whether or not she wanted to go ahead with it and have someone else present the report or, or try to do it at a time convenient for the chairman of the committee. So, you know, they believe it will be ready. The, the, the issue is uh, how it's going to be presented to the council anyway. Well, I think if it's all possible, the information should be around for us at budget time so we can get an idea of what they're thinking. I think that would behoove us, certainly. Anybody else? Okay, I'd like a motion for acknowledging receipt of this, please. So moved. Second. Okay. I'd like a better front cover on my eyes so it isn't quite as good as it used to be. That's all right. The report is not right. that. Oh, the to worry about. Thank you, sir. That was deliberately <laughs> faded out. Oh. You didn't get the secret message in there. I said you should put all of our names on there and see if we can figure them out. Mm. Okay. All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed, 7-0. Thank you. Okay. Item number 99 is to consider a request from the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department to seek community donations for a vehicle extrication device, also known as the Jaws of Life, and to take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? Yes. Uh, we're recommending this evening, uh, the fire chief and I, uh, that this request uh, be tabled. Uh, the reason we, with, we wish to withdraw it is that we feel it's important that whenever we go to the community uh, for any item that involves fundraising, uh, that, that it has the complete and full support of those uh, who will be using the equipment. Uh, it's become apparent uh, over the last month that the rescue unit in particular is not fully behind this uh, for reasons of timing, uh, for reasons of uh, need and perhaps other reasons as well. Uh, because of that, we don't feel comfortable uh, asking the council at this time uh, and would hope that, you know, if this returns at some point, that uh, it, it, it might be fully supported. But at this point, uh, uh, it isn't, so we don't feel right in uh, uh, proposing that it move forward at this time. Thank you. Any comments? Just one. Councilor Chapman. I think, uh, uh, personally, I would like to see that item in the fire department budget uh, for the next year rather than a fundraiser, just a kind of a message to you and the fire chief that that would certainly give us a chance to look at the pros and cons of, of it. And if it's worthwhile, we certainly can fit $18,000 into a budget and not have to have it go out for fundraising. That's the way I feel personally. Thank you. Councilor Pearson. Uh, I was going to second that opinion. Uh, in that if, it, if it's felt that it is uh, definitely a vital piece of equipment that's going to have a, a benefit for the uh, safety of the community, then it shouldn't be a fundraising. It should be part of the budget and part of the equipment uh, in that budget. Okay, thank you. Councilor Cossel. Now, I echo what my fellow councilors said. I was surprised to see that so close to budget time that an item of this size was proposed as a fundraiser. And I think that it really should be included in a budget report. Councilor Jordan? Well, I'd just like to say that, <coughs> excuse me, I think it should be a budget item and besides, I'm glad it was withdrawn. It helped me because I was very much against it because I felt that we didn't do it exceptionally well at the Lighthouse fundraising. And they're coming up within a couple of years for a new rescue unit for a replacement. And I think we've got to think ahead. And if it is needed, it should be a budget item. Thank you. I would I'd like to entertain a tabling motion. So moved. Second. All those in favor? All those opposed? 7 0. Item number 100 
is to consider a proposed amendment to the subdivision ordinance regarding dead-end road standards and take any necessary action. I'm going to ask the council to allow me to stand down from this for a perceived conflict of interest. Uh, the person bringing this forward is, I have a professional connection with him in my other hat in South Portland. If there's an objection, I will do that and ask Councilor Cogsell to take the chair for this. Thank you. This is item number 100 to consider a proposed amendment to the subdivision ordinance regarding dead-end road standards and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern, were you going yeah. to? I'd like to move down it. to the podium so we can use the map down there. Fine. I uh, wanted to move down here essentially to show you the map as well as provide you a little bit of history of this particular issue. Uh, many of you, uh, members of the public, and as, as I know the council is aware, uh, several years ago the town council adopted a uh, provision uh, that tightened up the dead end road standards in the community. Essentially, uh, it, the, the primary part was that it removed the planning board from the, white, from the right to waive uh, the standard that a dead end road could be no longer than 2,000 square feet. Uh, recently, uh, this issue has come up in a number of developments, including Stonegate uh, for its latest phase, and uh, even more recently uh, with the uh, Ramshead uh, proposed subdivision uh, that's sometimes known as, as the Spr uh, Sprague subdivision. Uh, recently, uh, Shaw Sprague, uh, the owner of the property uh, that's in been involved in the uh, Spr proposed Sprague subdivision, uh, recommended a, a provision uh, that would give the planning board the right to waive the dead end standard uh, for minor subdivisions. Uh, minor subdivisions are lots that are, uh, excuse me, subdivisions that are less than five lots. Uh, the staff had a meeting on Friday morning, the department heads and uh, really tried to look at this issue and to consider uh, the possibilities of how we might address this, perhaps if we could, could consider uh, or recommend to the town council some conditions uh, whereby the planning board uh, might waive the requirement uh, uh, for the dead end length in minor subdivisions. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm uh, sorry to uh, report that we were unable uh, to come up with, with any standards that we felt uh, would not compromise the public safety. Uh, we did look particularly at this area uh, involving a lot of where the stray corporation land is as well as some out parcels within, within that land. Uh, we, some, one of the concerns expressed at the department head meeting was that you could have minor subdivision after minor subdivision by different parties and what the cumulative effect may be. Uh, presently, we have a dead end extending from where uh, Sprague Hall is all the way down Fowler Road, all the way down Charles Jordan Road uh, to, to where the two pillars are, and then within the Sprague property itself. Uh, we also have uh, a number of uh, dirt roads or old uh, uh, farm-type roads that crisscross through this property. I asked Jerry Daigle, the town assessor, uh, following the meet on, meeting on Friday, to generally look at this area and to see what the possible build out may be in terms of the, the number of lots, the number of homes that one might expect uh, down there in the, the long course of history. This is not something that we're, we're anticipating too quickly. And after looking at wetland issues, setback issues, et cetera, it was Jerry's conservative estimate uh, that we could probably see in the long range approximately 250 homes or lots uh, in this particular area. Uh, interestingly, that number he came up with is almost exactly identical to Broad Cove, which is the area uh, that uh, we, uh, we first looked at and realized the need to, to tighten up the dead end road standard to begin with. Uh, secondly, uh, 
After the department head meeting, we have had another event uh, intervene uh, this past weekend. Uh, on Sunday morning at 4.30, there was a fire uh, down at the Rob uh, Mr. and Mrs. Robert A.G. Monk's residence, uh, which is approximately down in this location. Uh, it is reached by a, a dirt road uh, that extends off Bowery Beach Road, goes over a bridge, takes a lot of twists and turns uh, through the field. Uh, while the volunteer firemen were, were going to that fire when it was 16 below, whatever it was Sunday morning, as well as the trucks, it was noted just how slippery that road was and how awkward it is to reach. Um, ultimately, they were able to get there and fortunately they were able to uh, put out the fire. Uh, the chief called me at home Sunday morning and told me about the fire and told me about some of those problems. and. Um, you know, expressed concern that if a truck slid off the road or whatever, a uh, fire truck, that it could block the rest of the, the traffic from com coming down. Uh, subsequently, uh, on Sunday afternoon, uh, there was an insurance adjuster who was down at the monks looking at the damage. And as, I'm not sure if it was he or she, but uh, as the adjuster was driving back out, uh, their vehicle totally went off the road. And, you know, it, what happened on Sunday afternoon was almost exactly what the fire chief said might happen, uh, and, you know, there's, there's all that possibility. Also drove down into this area uh, <coughs> with the fire chief today, and as we were going to the parking lot, uh, he's, there was discussion whether or not to take his vehicle, and it was decided to take mine because it was four-wheel drive. And ultimately, we went down there. It was a good thing that we did because uh, we were trying, we would drove down, and again, you know, even though there had been some sand, it was still a little bit slippery we tried to see if we could access to do the loop. And what we found was this whole connector road going over to uh, what some might think is the, the Rams Head area of the Spray Corporation land uh, was unplowed. Uh, there were some wheel tracks we could get through. We eventually came up to a spot where there was a, a chain gate, which we didn't have a key. We tried to go up another way and ended up uh, in a very uneven uh, four-wheel drive came in handy having to to back up and eventually come back out and go the way we came in it it brought all the fears back to life that uh, that we do need a, a strong dead-end road standard and uh, that you know we ought to uh, give careful thought uh, to weakening uh, the dead-end standards that we now have uh, so for that reason uh, you know the staff I would like to recommend at this point uh, that you not refer this to the Ordinance Committee uh, and instead uh, move forward with the present policy. Uh, it is an area, you know, we do like to avoid lawsuits, uh, but, you know, nonetheless, sometimes you need, we feel you need to, you know, take the pain and bear it in a short time to perhaps save lives and uh, to uh, have a much better uh, standard in, in the long run. Thank you, Thank you Madam Mr. Acting Chairman. Comments from any councillors? Okay, was it about two years ago when we first started working on this dead end street standard? The reasons uh, for making it as stringent as it is, in fact, we actually lengthened it from 1,500 to 2,000 feet. But the reasons that were valid then, the dead end um, at Shore Acres, um, Beach Bluff Terrace, Broad Cove, which don't have second access, are still valid. And therefore, I would like a motion that we accept the recommendation of the um, administration and not forward this to the Ordinance Committee. I would like to move that, uh, Madam Chairman. Is there a I'll second? Sec I'll second that. Discussion? Mr. George. Uh, I would just like to couple of comments here which bothers me on this uh, set up here. They've talked about shore acres for 20 odd years and nothing ever gets done. This is the part that bothers me. They've talked about Broad Cove shortly after it was developed and anytime anybody goes to do anything they run into a roadblock. Nothing seems to happen. And, and the situation down in Sprague, and it was one of my comments at the time it was put together, what about Fowler Road and Charles E. Jordan Road? And I was told that wouldn't be considered because it had been there for a good number of years and is a well-traveled road. 
just because it's dead. And Hannaford Cove Road, there's many roads that seem so, it comes up anyone, every once in a while when somebody wants to do something, and, but we never get anything done to make this done, to make this happen. The developer that anybody wants to do it runs into a roadblock one place or another, either here or Augusta. And I don't know, I was gonna say, I wonder if my lifetime, if any of them will ever get done. I, I think, Councilor Jordan, the, the points you raise are exactly why we don't want another one of these to happen again. Uh, you know, if there's many read in this morning's newspaper, we're still working to try to get the broad goal situation resolved, and at least we do have a, an emergency access that has been uh, uh, approved for there if we can work out some of the, the other details with the developer. Uh, the Shore Acre problem remains. Uh, back when you served on the council years and years ago, there was an attempt to provide a connector uh, onto uh, a Ledgewood uh, Road Drive. Uh, the council did not want to move forward with that at, at that time. And, uh, looked at it again when we were looking at sewer easements through there when the sewer construction project was done in the early 80s and again the council decided not to go forward uh, you know if, if there is a change in policy at some point uh, you know the council can make that and we, we could make the, the necessary approaches but the only thing that bothers me it comes up when anybody wants to do anything it don't come up and nothing gets done in between and I think this one down here, I, I uh, <coughs> feel that, you know what I mean, I, even though it's in forest and what have you, that there's land enough so it can be taken care of anyway by emergency ones. Any other comments? There being none, um, I'll take a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, six zero. I'll turn the chair back over to our chairman. Thank you very much, Council Council, for dealing with that. Next item, item number 101, to consider a recommendation from the Ordinance Committee regarding a restructuring of non-department head line positions and take any <coughs> necessary action. Oh, oh. Mr. McGovern, do you have this? Or Council Council, I'm sorry, you're chairman of the Ordinance Committee. No, that's fine. I'd just soon have Mr. McGovern <laughs> explain his reorganization since it's so close to his heart. But our Ordinance Committee did um, meet with him and actually in a town council workshop, the council discussed the changes. And our only recommendation was to make sure that he updated the uh, job descriptions of the people who would be overseeing these change positions. Mm -hmm. And now we'll let Mr. McGovern explain it, if you want to. If you'd like, uh, this is, has briefly. been explained a number of times. Very briefly, this work. involves uh, uh, the wet team, the fire police unit, uh, the tree warden, the harbor master, and the seal of weights and measures. Currently, all of these different folks uh, report to the town manager directly and are among 19 total positions that report to the town manager. Uh, it's proposed that this be reduced to 14 in order to improve communication within the public safety area, uh, the administration of programs overall, and also, uh, quite frankly, to lessen uh, the impact of uh, 19 people uh, reporting to me all the time. Uh, specifically, the wet team uh, coordinator would uh, report to and be appointed by the fire chief. Uh, the fire police unit uh, would be within the police department reporting to, uh, to the chief of police. The tree warden would be in the Department of Public Works reporting to the director of public works. And the harbor master, uh, as it's a law enforcement position, would be appointed and report to the chief of police. The seal of weights and measures uh, would uh, work with the code enforcement officer. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from counselors on this? What we need to be doing with this is to set it to a public hearing, I believe. At the correct? regular March meeting. At the regular March meeting, the date of which we have not set, however. <laughs> Council Coxell? Madam Chairman, I move that we set 
<coughs> the reorganization of non-department headline positions for our March um, meeting at 7.30 p.m. here in the town hall. I believe it's going to be the 11th, but. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? We will set the March meeting later in this agenda and could perhaps repeat this public hearing at that time. Okay. All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? 7-0. Thank you. Item number 102 is to consider acknowledging receipt of a pavement management plan and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? Uh, several months ago, the Town Council authorized us to secure uh, the services of the firm of Casey and Godfrey uh, to do a pavement management <coughs> plan for the community. Uh, what this firm does is come in and looks at the pavement conditions of all our different roads, uh, assesses them on a, uh, on a scale of very good to uh, poor, to fair to poor, for, uh, fair along the whole continuum. Uh, they looked at, uh, at, at different levels. They look at the stresses, uh, uh, the cracks, uh, the distortion, uh, the amount of patching. And uh, this shows uh, the different uh, times when roads were paved, as well as uh, it actually gives a, a condition rating for each road. Uh, what it does show is uh, that we now have a, a fairly good level of commitment uh, to our roads. We traditionally have done so. And in order to maintain that level, uh, we would need to spend slightly over $900,000 uh, over the next five years. Uh, the capital improvement program, which you received earlier uh, this evening, recommended a funding level of $800,000. Uh, I think it, it's, it's fairly close. and. Uh, uh, shows that we can continue to maintain uh, the roads in Cape Elizabeth to the standards that citizens have become accustomed to. Thank you. Any questions or comments for the manager on this? No, I spoke to the manager about my comment. I thought every, most every road in Cape Elizabeth was writable. <laughs> well, I think this shows that they all are. Mm. <laughs> I don't think unrideable was one of the categories. <laughs> and I imagine most counselors did as I did and quickly turned to their own street to see what the proposed, what the condition was. <laughs> I, just, I do have one question. Council Council. Chairman, Is that in the very last page, they have Waterhouse Road as having to be reconstructed. Didn't we just complete a major project over there? I know it was drainage, but didn't we also do some road reconstruction at that point? No, we didn't reconstruct the whole road. Just a we section just with drainage. the drainage, so yeah. this is the balance of that road that needs to yes. be reconstructed. Mm. Some counselors read the whole thing. <laughs> Get to the W. I think this will be a useful instrument for us and something that we look at in conjunction. It'll be part of that um, blue thing, the capital improvement program. Any other comments? Well, I must say, uh, my only comment is it just goes to show you can do a study on anything uh, <laughs> these days. And uh, as you remember, I voted against this. I think it's, a, it's an extraordinary document. Um, I hope that it uh, continues to uh, allow us to have uh, better than average roads in Cape Elizabeth. And uh, uh, I hope that it also allows us to prioritize if we are going to be uh, expending in, uh, upwards of $800,000 in uh, Michael's projected five-year plan in this area. Thank you. Anybody else? I'd like a motion to acknowledge receipt of this report. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? 7-0. Thank you. Item number 103 is to consider authorizing a continuation of the application projects process with PACs for sidewalk construction in the town center and realignment of the intersection at the Spurwink Church and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, thus far in the, the PACs process, two projects have, have survived to date. Uh, they're the two just mentioned by the Chairman. Uh, no formal design has been done for either yet. And this is just an uh, item is to continue to update the Council and to ensure that you haven't changed your minds in terms of wanting to have these uh, still considered. Okay. 
no local funding is required at this time. However, if they were ultimately done, it would require a 15% uh, participation level for the community. But you could still back out at a later date. That's right. If you wanted to. I was going to move that we um, consider continuation of the application process with PACS for the sidewalk construction of the town center and realignment of the intersection of Spurwick Church. Second that. You said consider. To consider authorizing. Do, okay, I didn't hear authorized. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? All those opposed? 7 0. Councilor Cogswell. Are we really authorizing a continuation? We're authorizing a continuation. Yes. Please amend my motion to say authorize. Is that okay with the, who the second? Consider. Irv, Irv, you understand the amendment we just made? Yes, yeah, you second it? Yep. Thank you. Okay, item number 104 is, cons is for us to consider taking a position on a bill before the legislature to deregulate consumer-owned water districts, including the Portland Water District, and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern. Yes, I, we usually don't bring every bill before the council, uh, a legislative document that comes forward. However, this one is one that could have a, a major long-range impact on the community. Uh, the PUC, which is putting in putting this bill forward uh, into the hopper, uh, is uh, states that the primary reason for it is that consumer-owned uh, water districts are primarily governed by uh, elected officials, uh, or the the members of the the board of trustees are appointed by elected officials. Uh, while it's certainly true in the case of Portland Water District that they're elected, uh, unfortunately, uh, as long as the city-town rate differential remains, uh, there's a certain uh, party uh, to any proceedings involving water rates that will remain a minority party. Uh, and uh, it, it only allows us to have the PUC to truly protect uh, the rights of the minority. Uh, it's, it probably wouldn't be as, as much of an issue uh, if the city-town rate differential was done away with. However, uh, at this point in time, uh, it's really the only hope the towns have uh, to be adequately reviewed, uh, to have adequately reviewed our concerns. Uh, you know, it's, as you all know, we've saved uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for the towns as well as for the cities uh, through this rate case, and uh, the rate case would not have been possible if this legislation was in effect uh, uh, at, at the time. I would like to hear a motion on this, please. I guess Dahlbeck? By, yes, I guess based on uh, Mike's uh, recommendation, the appropriate motion would be to oppose this piece of legislation, and I will so move. Second motion. Thank you. Any discussion? Councilor Krillman. Now, uh, will, will Kate Elizabeth pay a, uh, a sizable fee to the lobbyist, uh, Mr. Donahue, about this issue, or? I don't, I, I spoke very briefly with Doug Harris, the manager of uh, Falmouth, about this when we were at another meeting last week, and he indicated that he was going to ask Mr. Donahue to, to take a look at it. Uh, my reaction was, uh, it's in Mr. Donahue's best interest to support, to oppose this legislation on his own uh, for his for his own firm's well-being and uh, I don't feel we ought to be paying him to lobby uh, to continue his full employment well, that's a good idea but uh, I mean are we going to put a money limit on this or you just I don't feel strongly that this won't be an assessment basically to the town of Cape no. Elizabeth I don't think we should pay for a professional lobbyist mm -hmm. Uh, on a bill before the legislature of, of this nature, I think uh, you know we should be able to represent ourselves very well. Okay. Other questions or comments on this? I think this is one bill that the manager and I can stay in touch with our legislators on. We will be seeing them later this week. In fact, 
Okay, we do have a motion that the council will oppose this bill. And we have a second. All those in favor of that motion? All those opposed? 7-0. Thank you. Item number 105 is to consider a report from the Appointments Committee regarding annual appointments and take any necessary action. Councilor Creelman is Chairman of our Appointments Committee. Would you like to tell us about this? I'd be delighted to, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, the Appointments Committee of the Town Council is comprised of myself and Councilor Chapel and Councilor Dahlbeck, and uh, we have been uh, busily interviewing uh, scores of Cape Elizabeth residents over the last uh, month or so in order to uh, fill our many uh, boards and commissions that really are the, the, the brains behind the, the wheels that make Cape Elizabeth run so smoothly. So it is uh, a distinct pleasure for me this evening to present to the council at large uh, all of the many uh, appointments that we as a committee are recommending uh, for uh, acceptance this evening. And I am hopeful that all of the uh, councilors not officially on the appointments committee have in their packet appropriate uh, resumes of the uh, many individuals who are uh, going to be appointed this evening. To that order, for the Area Development Council, uh, we are recommending Louis Sorales uh, to be uh, completing his term in March of 1994. On the planning board, a, a three-year term for Judy Lardner, a three-year term for Mark Wilcox, a one-year associate a planning board term for Bob Marvin and a one-year associate planning board uh, term for Peter Cotter. On the zoning board, Wyatt Garfield uh, will be serving a second uh, three-year term. Robert Perna will continue as a zoning board associate for an additional year as will Linda Jacobs also be continuing as a Zoning Board Associate for an additional year. On the Board of Health, Gregory Toot is being appointed to a three-year term, and Peggy Fogg is serving a second consecutive three-year term. On the Conservation Commission, Jean Ginn Marvin is serving a, a three-year term, Patrick Carroll will be completing a second three-year term. Keith Moe will be completing, I should say, being appointed to a, a two-year term. And James Bevel, Jr. will be completing a three-year term. On the Riverside Cemetery trustees, Wayne Brooking will be serving a third uh, three-year term. It is the prerogative of the uh, council in special circumstances to waive the uh, requirement that an individual take a full year off of a particular board or commission before being eligible to be uh, reappointed to that particular board. And in Mr. Uh, Brookings circumstances, we have uh, waived that rule due to special circumstances uh, as well as the uh, superlative work he has done on the uh, Riverside Cemetery <coughs> trustees. On the Thomas Memorial Library trustees, Mark Lombard is appointed to a three-year term, and Dr. Joseph Schenkel will be completing a second uh, three-year term. Trish Katz will also be completing a second three-year term. And Susan DeCessere will be completing a, a two-year uh, term coming due in March 1st of 95. Mary Be Beth Tackick will be completing a, a Thomas Memorial Library trustees term <coughs> in March of 1994. On the a CATV Advisory Board, uh, William Robodeau, Jr. Uh, will be serving a three-year term, and L. Richard Murray will also be serving a three-year term. 
On the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, Randy Wheel will be completing a second three-year term, and Pierrette Lawler will be beginning her uh, first three-year term. On the Board of Historic Preservation Advisors, Deborah Connolly will be completing a second three-year term. Michael Katz will be given a uh, three-year term, and Donald B. Weeks will also be serving a three-year term. On the Arts Commission, Barbara Newcomb will be serving a three-year term. George Knowles will be completing a second three-year term on the Board of Harbor Commissioners. On the Board of Sewer Appeals, Maureen L. McQuaid will be serving a three-year term. Robertson Breed will be serving a three-year term. And Sheila Hillman will be completing a second three-year term. On the Personnel Appeals Board, Joseph Groff will be serving a three-year term. On the Family Fun Day Committee, Marnie Souza will be finishing a, a second term being completed in 1995. And all of the Family Fun Day Committee terms will come due September 1st, unlike the rest of all of the uh, boards and commissions that come due on March 1st. Deborah A. Garabato will be completing a term in September of 95. And Michelle Childs Flynn will be completing a term in 1995. On the Recycling Committee, Bonnie Wright will be serving a three-year term, and David B. Murray will be serving a three-year term. As, a, as our fair hearing officer, uh, W. John Ammerling will be serving a three-year term. And on the Community Services Advisory Board, as a town a council appointment, uh, Jane Greer will be reappointed to a second uh, three-year term. Uh, I should ask the town clerk, did I miss anyone? Are we on target here? Then I would only conclude by saying that it truly, uh, and I'm sure I speak for the appointments committee, uh, it was a distinct pleasure to have an opportunity to meet uh, the many individuals uh, desiring to serve Cape Elizabeth. It's always a uh, really enjoyable task to uh, meet uh, with town citizens. Uh, our council chair joined us uh, one evening uh, to make the process even more fun, and uh, I would respectfully uh, submit all of these uh, very generous people's uh, names to the council for appointment as uh, so noted. Second that. Thank you. Do we have any comments from councilors? Your committee spent a considerable amount of time. We do thank you for that. And I know it's a concentrated period of time that you conduct these interviews. And I certainly enjoyed the evening I spent with you. And it's always a treat to meet people who are volunteering to come out and offer their services to the community. With that, let us have a, a vote, please. All those in favor of the motion. All those opposed? 7-0. Thank you very much. We look forward for all of the new people coming onto boards and commissions to welcoming you and let, just to let you know that if you do need any help from the council, do get in touch. Item number 106 is to consider establishing a new date for the March town council meeting and take any necessary action. And I would propose that we have a motion to the effect that the March Town Council meeting be held on Thursday, March 11th, at the regular time. We're not changing the time, only the date. <coughs> so moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? 7-0. Town Council meeting in March will be held on Thursday, March 11th. At that time, we will have a public hearing on something <laughs> on the restructuring of the non-department headline positions thank you item number 107 is to consider entering into executive session to review two applications for poverty abatements and to continue the annual evaluation of the town manager and take any necessary action i will say this expecting that we do not have any comments from citizens since we have no citizens in the audience. 
Mr. McGovern. Yeah, I, I would ask that when a counselor makes this motion that they consider adding to the motion uh, and to discuss matters relating to property acquisition and, an, and to discuss an opinion from the town attorney. <coughs> property acquisition and an opinion from the town attorney. Councilor Dalbeck. I would move all of that. Thank you. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Seven to zero. Thank you. We will not be coming, we will not need the cameras as we come out of executive session. We thank you for being behind the cameras in the control room this evening, and we will see you next month on Thursday the 11th. Thank you.